you're talking to the one person in the world, maybe three people in the world. The other one is at Goldman Sachs. The other one is at McKinsey. But you're talking to the one person in the world who's less than $5 million to have a conversation with for a few minutes who has solved your problem a thousand times. This is Alex Cleanthus, and today we're talking with Oren Claff, who's one of the world's leading experts on sales, on raising capital, and negotiation. He's the best-selling author of Pitch Anything and Flip the Script, and he's the director of capital markets at Intersection Capital. Today, we'll be talking about how to get more meetings, how to win more pitches, and how to close more deals. And just quickly, before we get started, make sure to go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you get the latest episodes as soon as they're released. Let's get into it. Hello, and welcome, Oren. Hey, thank you. That's a very warm welcome. Yeah. Um, um, and this is pretty exciting because I first actually heard about you 10 years ago, I guess, or maybe eight or nine years ago, uh, just because of the book uh, Pitch Anything, which was kind of had this counterintuitive um, approach to sales that comes from someone with extreme experience, with, 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 with um, significant experience, right? And Yeah, so it's so counterintuitive, no one wanted to publish it. Really? <laughs> No. Really? Wow. So that was so that was a sales process in itself, right? And I'm sure you had to use some of the principles there to pitch it. So so I go uh, Simon and Schuster, you know, didn't want it. Um, you know, the a, a bunch of the big publishers didn't want it. The publisher I'm currently with didn't want it. Uh, so finally, I went to McGraw Hill, right? And I walk in there, and they have the senior editor who is really like this this august. I, I want to be kind, you know, 60s years old editor in New York. Their office is in Manhattan. They have the entire building. It says McGraw Hill on it. You're in the conference room overlooking Manhattan. They have all their little interns. You know, they, they have nine people around the table. My agent and I walk in, right? And I, it's obviously who's the senior editor, who makes the choices, who's running the meeting, right? Uh, and her name was Anne. So, uh, I can't remember her last name. So I turn my attention to the lowliest analyst, uh, you know, intern in the room. I go, Ann, it's lovely to meet you. It's been good to talk to you on the phone. But listen, here's how this meeting is going to go, right? And, and so I yell at her and she goes, I, 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 I'm not Ann. I'm like, okay, well, if you're not Ann, who are you? Why are you in this room, right? And then the lady <laughs> speaks up and she goes, what is happening? And, and the intern goes, he's doing it. He's doing it to us, <laughs> right? And I go, well, what do you want? Like, you expect me to come here and beg for the book deal? Of course, I'm going to do the stuff that's in the book about the book in order to get the book. And they're like, yeah, you're in. Yeah. And, but that's a, such a great story. And, you know, it's fascinating uh, that some of these counterintuitive approaches um, to traditional ideas, they don't seem to cut through a lot of times, right? Because it's not safe, right? And I think... You know, so what's interesting about, you know, some of your approaches is that the fact that they are not safe is probably part of the reason that they actually have impact, that they actually stand out, you know? Well, the other side of not safe, two sides of that pancake, is it raises the stakes, all right? And I'll tell you a little, but, uh, but, but I have a little rant before I get into that. Um, I'll tell you something else that's counterintuitive. If you speak to actual authors of the books you read, and I get them on podcasts, right? And there's something in their book and I go, do it. Okay, you know branding, you know sales. All right, here's a situation, like run your, run your shit, right? And they're like, well, you know, strategy and thesis and big think. I'm like, wait a second, you wrote an entire book and you dragged me to your podcast. You can't actually do it. So Alex, anything in there, you ask me, flash roll, winter's coming, uh, um, plain vanilla, I'll, we'll just, invent a company, invent the product, and we'll run through actual tactics and techniques live, right? So the different counterintuitive is people write books and then you can't actually do the stuff. And then you go mm. on a podcast. So we're going to do stuff. But um, listen, listen, uh, I have this big, let's see, um, I have this giant uh, G-Wagon. It's called a G550 square. It's 200 of them in the world. So there's like a regular, you know, Mercedes G-Wagon. This one is like super size. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but they're no, massive. I haven't seen it. I'm going to okay, look right after this podcast. I'm going to look at it. <laughs> Look at look it up while we're talking. It's 22 inches taller than a full size Range Rover. It's massive. So anyway, uh, I pack my family in it, and we're driving over the Coronado Bridge here in San Diego, right? And that goes like, uh, and you're looking down at battleships, 
like they look like Lego toys. You're you're in the sky. Apollo and Zeus are there. Hey, would you like a coffee? Like <laughs> handing their hand comes out of the clouds. You are in the clouds, and and I'm in this giant G wagon that we have. I don't know why we have it, but whatever. And and the foot wall is like this high on this giant bridge, at least, right? And I, and so I slow down. You know, people are honking. Like by the way, you know, I, I drive fast. I race. I race motorcycles. You know, we turn the camera around. You know, there's some race cars right there. 10 feet in front of me, but I slow this truck down to 20 miles an hour, right? Because I'm high in the air. I'm in a big truck. The foot wall is low and I have my family in it. The stakes are high. You raise the stakes and things seem scary. So the trick is in sales. And I think this is what we should talk about, you know, business development and you get out there. It's raising the stakes, right? At, but having a skill level. What happens is people raise the stakes. like you know, what's raising the stakes saying to a customer, why are you asking me for a discount? This makes no sense, right? You want your vendors not to make any money. You deserve free product. Like what? Is, so, so why wouldn't you say that to a buyer, right? Well, because it raises the stakes and then they say, Hey, you're being rude to me. I, I'm going to work with, you know, my other vendors are nice and I don't like rude vendors. So could, but, but when people say to me, Hey, can we get a 30% discount? I go, well, I'm sorry. I confused you. <laughs> right? <laughs> I feel terrible, but I feel like this meeting just ended. So raising the stakes, but I have the skills to raise it. So, so really things feel edgy, um, but if other people can get them to work, maybe you can get the skills to raise the stakes and it, it just focuses decision-making when the stakes mm. go higher. And yeah. ultimately this is what I feel the problem is today. When you used to fly somewhere to Chicago, right? From California, go to a meeting, everybody get in that meeting. The stakes were high because you spent money, you traveled. Um, there's a, you know, there's a lot going on. And they just came in and said, Hey, we rescheduled, um, you know, could you do three o'clock? And like, Whoa, no, no, sir. No, sir. Not right. And yeah, I'm, you'll be 21 years old and intern. No, sir. We are not rescheduling. I have to get to my grandma's funeral. Fuck you. Right. We're having this meeting because the stakes are high. You get on a zoom, and they go, hey, I'm sorry, you know, big Mr. Big couldn't make it. Can we reschedule for never? Like, oh, yeah, anything you want, you know, because mm. the stakes are low. So mm. raising the stakes to signaling that I am not an information booth on the freeway of you trying to get a discount on whatever it is you're trying to buy. I, my time, and then I think, you know, now we're somewhere. Signaling in Zoom and in today's world in which connections are so so uh, quick and easy, my time, this call is as valuable, if not more valuable than your time. That's the signaling that raises the stakes. You are talking to the number one expert in the world who solves the shitty problem that you created for yourself. I don't have that problem. Our accounting system runs perfectly. We're not having an IRS audit. We're not getting crypto security scammed. Like we don't have these problems. You have the problem. Not only do you have it, you have it as bad as anybody can get it. In fact, if you get this problem any more, any worse, me and anybody credible is not even going to be willing to work on it. Mm. Okay. Because you're just going to be, you'd be like, Hey, come visit us on hell Island. No, thank you. I don't want to go to hell Island. That's where you are. Right. And it doesn't sound enticing. So, so now we're talking about uh, a correctly raising the stakes and letting people, and the stakes are, you have a problem, it's not going away. If you don't solve it, it's gonna get worse. You're talking to the one person in the world, maybe three people in the world, the other one is at Goldman Sachs, the other one is at McKinsey, but you're talking to one person in the world who's less than $5 million to have a conversation with for a few minutes who has solved your problem a thousand times. Alex, mm -hmm. you know I solved this problem? I, I, I hit that that was the easy button and I, fall, I, like, I do it while I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. Like, okay. We saw it's a complicated problem, but we solve it all the time. So let me contribute some of my time and my day to helping you out. Okay. But efficient. Let's be efficient. Mm, mm. And now we have a call. And for the listeners, he just pulled out a bunch of tactics, pulled them all together into that one little example, right? This book, uh, Flip the Script, um, you know, so I got it um, a couple of months back, um, maybe three or four months back, and I was just going through it. Uh, because I got pitch anything, I got flip the script. It's one of the only books that I bought uh, the audio book, the, the physical book, the Kindle book. I took notes. I have purchased it for people. 
Um, it is for enterprise level sales and for enterprise level, I guess, engagement is one of the most refreshing approaches since pitch anything, surprisingly. Um, so I'm going to try my best to touch on it at a very high level um, and just to give the listeners, I guess, um, a quick overview so they get, you know, kind of some of, of the substance. But I highly recommend everyone to purchase this book, right? This book for enterprise sales and for how to structure a deal simplifies it in a really sophisticated way, right? And I'm sure that um, the conversation with Owen right now, he's going to be showing examples of how he positions himself. Like he just did it a second ago, right? With He just flipped it like on the person, right? So, and, and I think to jump in on you, like the, the big thing to notice is status, all right? Status is drives a lot of the, your ability. Everybody wants to close, right? That's the fun part. Teach me some closing lines. Teach me pickup lines. Teach me, you know, ways to close, right? But the way, uh, let me teach you my best close. Uh, guys, we're out of time. What should we be doing together? I have to jet. That's <laughs> the close. Now, what, that's very powerful. What should we be doing together, right? But the reason you can use that close is when you open high status and you open as an expert and you have tons of actual and perceived value, then you have something to take away. Mm. And the reason I wanted to go there is because I had on my podcast, uh, Anthony Scaramucci, who was the uh, White House communications director for 11 days. He's on CNN. You know, he, maybe he looks a little bit goofy online to you, but he is the, you know, he, he worked for Goldman Sachs, manages a $4 billion fund, um, graduated Harvard Business School, has a degree in finance. Like he's a, you know, and he was at the White. He's a real dude. So I get on the podcast and I can just, he just flashed it and I can see he's doing his own stuff. He probably doesn't know my name. The PR director just, you know, booked us. And I'm like, this guy's going to be a problem because he's just going to phone it in. And you can see that I don't like phoned in interviews. Right. Uh, so he's just going to phone it in. He's probably not even looking in the camera and it's just going to be this smooth, you know, Hey, I was white house director, blah, uh, Trump and blah, blah, blah. blah right. But bing, bada bong, bada boom. So he comes on and I go, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so excited to have here today. And, and it's just, it's unbelievable that I was able to get such a guest to this podcast. Uh, it's, it's really unthinkable. Somebody I've been wanting to talk to for, for many, many years. Um, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Kathy West from ARC uh, Investments. And he goes, what? I, I'm not Kathy. I'm like, what? You're not, who are you? What are you doing? Like, what are you doing? So, so status works both ways. When somebody comes in super high status, right? They're going to, when, when somebody feels powerful over you, they don't listen well. They don't see you as a person. They see you transactionally and they take risks with you that they wouldn't take with a peer or somebody more powerful than them. So when people believe that they are higher status than you or more powerful than you, again, this is so, so important. Um, they take, they take risks. They wouldn't take otherwise. They see you transactionally and only as a surface level and aren't interested in you. All right. And so sometimes, uh, you've got to lower somebody's status, which is tricky, but you know, just showed you there how to do it. And, um, I've done that many times with celebrities, like every celebrity I meet, I have to do the exact same thing and give you other examples, but you, you, I can give you another example of lowering somebody's status to your level. So first part in terms of the process of, of um, the flip the script process, let's call it, um, is status alignment, right? So this is basically just to ensure that that the person who you're trying to engage with sees you at least at the same level, right? And so Correct. this is the conversation so far. And so what we just spoke about was that there's basically increasing how you're perceived or, you know, just lowering them, right? So if you could provide an example of both, that'd be great, right? Because I think sure. this is the hardest part for people to, I think, comprehend is like, how do I establish status when maybe I don't think I have the status, you know? So most people sabotage their own status. Hey, Alex, so great to be on the podcast. Oh my God, I'm, I'm really excited to do it. I'm a little bit nervous, you know, to be on. Um, I, I did, a, you know, a ton of prep. Can you hear me okay? Like, do I look okay? It's just... Um, you know, I have, my, I have my mom iron my shirt, you know, because I really want to look good. Anyway, am I talking too much? So, all right, no reason to do all that. 
and, and I'm, I'm exaggerating, but more like, hey, I'm really excited to be here. Um, we prepare, we have a presentation we'd like to show you. I think you're going to love it. Uh, want to let you know at our company, customer service is number one. You can call us on the weekend. I give you my grandmother's fax number, whatever you need to reach me, you, anytime, day or night. We do whatever it takes to keep the customer happy. I think you're going to love this presentation. I'm going to show it to you, and then I'll ask you if you have any questions. Uh, and then, um, you know, I, anyway, I really think you're going to like this presentation. Woo! Okay. So that's <laughs> a mistake. I'll give you an example that's done at a very sophisticated level, probably very similar to, uh, you know, the, the Anthony Scaramucci example I just gave you. By the way, at the end of that podcast with Anthony Scaramucci, he goes, Orrin, um, oh my God, I want to drive down and meet you and let's do something together. So we started with, I don't know who this person is. My PR agent made me take this and I'm going to phone it in with White House, blah, 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 to how do I'll drive to you and let's work together. That's status alignment. Give you another quick example here because I know we have other things to get to. But um, uh, uh, I was speaking at an, a large event and the speaker uh, before me was Emmett Smith. Emmett Smith is the Dallas Cowboys MVP, you know, maybe the most well-known football player in America from that era. The Dallas Cowboys uh, Super Bowl winning dynasty uh, MVP multiple times of the league, of the Super Bowl, and and 100 millionaire, and then went on and resurgence, one dancing with the stars. So it's just me and Emmett Smith in the green room waiting to go speak. And the, the organizer, and he has an entourage, but the entourage has to split off because the deal is it's just he and I in the green room eventually. So the conference organizer goes, uh, hey, hey, Orrin, I want to introduce you to, I go, wait, oh my God, I never, I never thought I would ever get to meet Randall Cunningham who's another football player, but it's not Emerson. And, and he goes, I, I ain't Randall Cunningham. Like, there's not a person in America that doesn't go, oh, Emmett, oh my God, I remember you from the Super Bowl. Can I get your autograph? Except for Orrin Claff, because I would love to do that. I'd love him to sign my, my rump, right? In permanent marker, <laughs> of course. I, I want to hug him and lick his face. I love football. <laughs> but if I do that, He's going to be like, yeah, whatever. Like, so finally, I just, I was on him. Finally he goes, I'm sorry, what's your name? Right? Wh what do you do? So Emmett Smith asked Orrin Claff, what does he do? What's his career? What are his goals in life? Does he have any kids? When I got the status aligned, when he thought he was a superstar and I was a peon speaker from, you know, fanboy, 46-year-old white dude, um, um, you know, dreaming of one day meeting Emmett Smith, I had no value. When I didn't care about any of that, and I didn't even know who he was, right? And we were just got peer to peer. Then we had status alignment. So, so um, you cannot ca go into the customer and get a meeting with the CEO and put them on a pedestal and make them feel more powerful than you. As we said, that's status alignment for sure. And so, okay, let's say that it is the CEO, right? And let's say that there yeah. is a presentation that's super important, right? Now, the stakes are high, and now you either have the decision to increase your own status or to put them a bit lower down in their status, we'll call you're, it, right? You're going to have to take them lower. You have to take them lower. And I'm going to give you the tool is to Is that do. the only way, is it? You can't increase you're, yourself you're not, to that level. Yeah, because they come in, they're not listening to you. It's yeah. transactional, right? They're not listening to you. You can say, hey, I just have mined rare earth minerals from an asteroid. I built the own suit. I flew up to it. I got the rare earth minerals here. And I have a goose that shits out golden coins, right? And there's going to, sorry, what, was, what were you saying again? Okay. Right? So how do you and, do it tactfully so, then? Because it seems yes, risky for how. some clients. It's a $10 million this deal. Yeah. You don't have to do it the Orange Claff way. Here's the issue. You, what can you do? Like, we're a great company. We try really hard. Uh, Microsoft is our client. Uh, you know, they don't care. Mm, and it's, it's very hard to raise your... You got to pull them down a little bit. The tactful, reasonable way to do it is, is uh, I love you guys. I'm very excited about this meeting. Really prepared hard for it. Um, uh, do am thankful for the time, you know, with senior leadership. And I see you're, you're confused. You're like, wait a second. This is exactly what you said not to do, but it's a setup. So that's a setup. Excited to be here. Very mindful time with leadership. Prepared really hard. I've got a presentation for you. I hope you love it. One thing that I aim to do in this meeting is I see some things that you guys are saying and trying to do 
but I also see some things on the website that are confusing, that are actually the opposite of what I would expect you guys to do and say, given what I'm hearing from you in this scope of work. So my goal is to square, you know, square that hole and try and figure out what is actually going on here. Mm. Okay. So you're calling something We're out. Calling every single company will be doing something weird. Disney is doing all this weird LGBTQ equal sign apostrophe, you know, backwards three, uh, which is fine, right? But you know, Disney is a is that. Disney used to be like, hey, we're going to come over and the kids are going to watch Disney movies. Great, right? They got to be careful that, 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 so every company, even Disney is doing weird things. So pull something weird and say, just we're seeing these things. Most companies will have something on their website that is anathema to how they're behaving. So it's just really easy. I saw some on the website. It says you're the founder friendly company, but then I see you guys retrading every single deal, you know, and grinding. So I'm trying to figure out well, if either one is fine, I just don't, it's confusing who you really are. And as part of this conversation, I'd like to get that cleared up. But of course, we're going to present to you what, you know, we think you should do next and why you should work with us and why we're the best. So that is supplicating as a setup. And then, um, uh, you know, uh, pulling them down a peg. I'll give you an easier way to test this out. All mm -hmm. right. That is incredibly powerful. It works best on Zoom calls or phone calls, but meetings as well, right? Um, so in my experience, I work with billionaires, I work with CEOs, and I work with leadership. They always come to a call late. Three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes. If it goes past eight minutes, we, you know, buy mm. um, mm. and reset. Three I give minutes, them five minutes, usually. I give them five. five. Minutes. Okay, so yeah. they come late, right? Yeah. And I always go, Alex, hey, welcome to the 10.05 call. Simple. And it's amazing. You have to do this. And so every senior manager knows the value of time. A hundred percent of the time they'll go, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. You know, and they'll say things like, I'm sorry, you know, we have a ship that's at the port of Los Angeles and we're trying to unload medical supplies critical for children. And I had to sign off to get the medical supplies approved by the government. I'm so sorry. And so they will start out apologizing to you, rightly so. Right? They didn't say, hey, I'm going to be a few minutes late. So, hey, welcome to the 10.05 call. Are you ready? We can get that, we can get that call started now if you want. Uh, very nice, fun, easy way. Does anybody need fluids in, out? If not, let's get that call started. Yeah, that's good. Nice okay. and easy. That's really, and that's a really good little tip. And it's really just put them, uh, to put them off balance, right? That's what you're trying to do. Just put them a little bit off balance. What? Hey, what's going on here? This is not how I've spoken to you usually. What? There's something here, and, maybe. You know, it, it's that, it, isn't it? No one will be offended by that. By the way, mm. if somebody's offended by that, I, I mean, I probably have done that three thousand times. If somebody is offended by that, huge warning sign, right? Everybody knows the value of time. You came to the call on time. You set it up. You were professional. It, if they don't say, yeah, that's pretty funny. That there's a, and that's the other thing about these kind of frame control things is if people act weird, right? But everything you and I are going to talk about is about taking the normal, mm. owning the center line, owning normal. What's normal? Showing up on time, having values, putting stuff on your website that it, you, you say what you mean, you do what you say, that syncs up with how you actually behave. Whenever you take that moral center, right? They're constantly fighting. Your jokes are actually funny. Okay. Like they're constantly fighting to pull themselves back into the high status center. And so you take that position. Um, happy to be flexible. I see you're here for the 1005 meeting. We can get that meeting started. Um, anybody need fluids in or out? If not guys, let's roll. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So sorry. Love you. Blah, 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 right. So, so that, so that's great. And by the way, that's just jujitsu class day one, you don't have to flip somebody over your back, <laughs> spin around, flying rear naked choke. All it is is tapping them on the shoulder yeah. and turning them a little bit sideways. Jiu-jitsu yeah. day one. Yeah. There's yeah. no risk in that. Yeah. Definitely start, and it's fun, by the way. And like, yeah. like everything you'll see about what I do is not intended to control people. It's just intended to own the center line, mm. which is fun, interesting, unique, 
high integrity, have value, an expert, high status, and busy. When yeah. you own that, then people are constantly trying to meet your standard. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And so this is part of status alignment. There's there's a lot more in the book around kind of the terminology, the words, the 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 shared stories, um, their problems in like their industry. So there's quite a lot that can be added to this. This is um, a fantastic way just to start a meeting well. You know, start a meeting Let's just so that they talk, listen, right? Talk about that for a second. Yep. Right. Yep. Uh, if people don't think you know their industry, it's very hard for them to trust you with a conversation. So some alignment that I have some profile and understanding of your industry. And I'm just, you know, then now we've got status alignment and we've got a basis for a trusted conversation. Mm. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's really interesting because, you know, I think, what status alignment thinking forces people to do, um, professionals to do, is to do the research before they start talking to someone. I think there's so much shortcutting of like, hey, you know, like it's me, 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 me. It's not about them. It's not about trying to come to them and to meet them. It's all about, hey, like if I do a thousand of these outreaches and I get a hundred responses and I get 10 things and I do two of those, then all of a sudden I'm going to get a sale. And it just doesn't like that maybe worked. 10 years ago, maybe. But these days, it's a lot more competitive. Everything's on Zoom. It's getting a lot more competitive even just to cut through. So I think like a lot of these are really good ways to cut through. Um, but I am, uh, so I'm going to move it to the next point, right? And this part will keep high level um, because it can get technical, but the flash roll. No, so the flash roll, I'll just start it, right? The flash roll, I'm sure that, of course, uh, for the listeners, right? You've always been told to not talk technical jargon to prospects, right? To not say, hey, to not have acronyms and to not go too technical. Now, like in this book, Flip the Script, again, like I'm, I'm extremely impressed by this book. Um, he, there's a thing called a flash roll where for 90 seconds, you get super technical, <laughs> right? And then the aim of it is to really just to bam, uh, to show technical expertise, right? And so can you just talk about just where this came from at least, like the thinking, because it's the first time I heard use all the jargons, make it as technical as possible, but keep it short. For sure. Uh, if you've ever watched CNBC's Squawk Box, right, and listen to the CEO of 10,000 employee companies, you know, Shell Oil or... Um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to think like, uh, you know, they have these, these big com manufacturing, you know, concerns or, uh, you know, 3,000 employees and $4 billion of revenue. They really fall into two camps. One are like these strategy guys. Uh, and and uh, actually, you, see, you also see them on this show like undercover bots, right? Mm. They like run 7-Eleven. Right. And he goes and he like has to prepare the nachos. And he's like, well, uh, you know, where does the nacho go? And oh, cheese goes on it. Right. Wait, jalapeno. Like he doesn't know anything about how to do it. And, and so in Squawk Box, you have guys like, yeah, um, you know, based on the um, uh, the uptick of the inflation and the power purchasing of the dollar, it feels like, you know, we're going to our supply chain is going to need to tighten over the next three months. Right. And then there's like big, high level strategic. All right. The, the CEOs that you really respect are the guys who have done all the jobs coming up to the company. And they can get super tactical briefly and then come up to strategy. What are you guys doing in the business? So, so like, you know, a guy running the Audi. We really feel like electric. This is perfect. I'm just making this up on the spot, but I think this is a great example. We really feel like gas engines have lived their time. That's why we've committed by 2028 to have all electric vehicles in our thing. We think that's what consumers want. We think that's what the mandate is for the uh, what, what government mandates are going to be. And we think that's actually going to be good for our business and improve the bottom line. But it's interesting, right? So that's great. Strategy, that's a CEO, right? Um, but what's amazing is when they go, 
you know, I'm down in the EV lab and really at 1.2 angstroms, you can get those electric vehicle motors to really have the, uh, the, you know, the level of power per horsepower per pound that is over a hundred times that you could get with a gasoline engine, right? When we put that on the test track and, and, you know, and really monitor the data, you know, I look at the split testing between this and this, and I've been on the track for a couple of days, you know, actually driving the car. And then we look at the data uh, and you see this red, I actually have it on my phone here. You see this red line here. That's where we are hitting the economic level of power performance that is 10 times higher than gas. And that's really where we want to be. And it's a pleasure to drive that vehicle because the, the response rate at the shocks mimics that of what you could get in a typical luxury car at a third of the price. And you're like this motherfucker right here, running the business, driving the cars, looking at the data, talking to engineers, right? And, uh, and you go, well, he goes, yeah, you know, I was an electrical engineer for a couple of years and then I moved up to management. And you go, this guy can get super deep. There's no level of deep that I can take him where he's going to run out of uh, awareness of what he's doing. This is a problem with salespeople. We believe you want the order. <laughs> we believe you're going to try hard. We believe your product has a value proposition. Right? We believe when we install it, you know, it's going to install and things are going to happen. Uh, what I don't believe is you really understand the product at an implementation level. I don't believe that you live in the details. I think you're just a sales guy. And then if I want to have any details, you have to go, well, I'm, uh, you know, I have to get my sales engineer you know, or my engineer in, or I have to get my CFO in, or I have to get the founder in. I give you another little story that, that shows you the harm in not being able to get super technical for a short period of time. Oh, it's the, so by the way, this skill set of being broad, value proposition, strategy, thesis, capability, um, understanding your problem, problem solution, how things are changing, you know, understanding the need, for a solution to a broad set of problems, but then being able to go deep, that is magical. It, cause, it has people trust you, believe in you, when they don't think you're just a generalist. And then the other thing is most people who go deep into the details, engineering, technical specifications, mathematics, financial analysis, they stay there. They can't get out of that hole. They go deep and they stay deep and then that's why that's why the advice is where you started. Don't um, get into jargon. Don't get into engineering. Keep people out of that. Keep them high level in sales, right? Because it's overwhelming. But when you can go for 90 seconds into this flash roll and just expose. So the details are not for comprehension. You're not teaching anybody anything about the details. All you're doing is showing them in the flash roll that you have technical mastery of your subject. And the power of this is amazing. And but so now we're in the office, right? It's a thing we do here. And everybody's like, oh, he just flash rolled me. I know he doesn't really know that stuff, right? <laughs> yeah. Because, because everybody's now learning these flash rolls, you know, to signal that they know a subject. And he's like, wait, did you just flash? More? So now we don't even know who knows what <laughs> in what deal around here because they're, they're these, these flash rolls. Did you just flash roll me? I just want to give you a quick example. I know you want to move on. but um, So I'm trying to buy this software, this, this uh, encoding software. I'm pretty technical. Um, this video encoding software to get in a certain format that we need for our presentations, right? And I'm on the website of the company that provides this software. Uh, and so I have a couple of questions and I get on the uh, chat with, you know, one of their customer service people. And I'm asking very technical questions and they're answering um, in, in like broad euphemisms. Yes, of course we do that. We've done that for years. Our software does it. And I go, listen, I need to talk to somebody who's technical, right? These answers are not satisfying me. And he goes, so then he chats back, I'm technical. I go, doesn't seem like you are. And then he got, writes back, I'm the founder, right? And the CTO. I'm like, what, dummy? Why are you not showing me your depth, your technical depth mm. so I can believe in you? So as a salesperson, you have to find a way to show uh, some technical depth in your product and in your industry. 
You don't have to do it for five or 10 or 15, for 90 seconds, just show me that you can get into the details, come back out and keep moving on value proposition and uh, strategy. And, you know, just some ideas around that just could be cool. So um, specific industry insight and then a technical application like of that execution, right? So there can be some prep and there can be some scripting and there can be some practice where you have enough to go on, right? And hopefully the person who you're presenting to hasn't read flip the script and they're just trying to check in on uh, some of those things. But look, I mean, I have not, um, this is the first time I've heard about something like this, right? So I don't think it's out there yet, right? So now's the time to start to use this, right? Because in the beginning when, you know, it's a novel idea, which we're, which we're going to get to in a minute, um, um, it can start to be effective, right? But the big idea, right? It's kind of winter is coming, you know, it's the thing which you're coming to them um, with, right? So I think, yeah, yeah. please. It, if somebody doesn't believe the world is changing and that change is going to sweep what they're doing away, then they don't have motivation to listen, to change and to adapt to a new world order. Now, it used to be hard to come up with winter is coming, you know, five years ago because nothing was fucking going on, okay? But today, you know, every <laughs> oh single God. industry and every single egg, winter is not only coming, it's come. So you have the pandemic, you have travel restrictions, you have masking, you have vaccines, you have right-left polarization, you have logistics problems, you have high cost of gas, you have inflation, stagflation. I mean, every single industry is changing. So unless you come in and say, you know, so pick an industry, Alex, and let's let's try and tackle something. Um, <laughs> insurance. Insurance. Uh, great. Um, so, so the, ins you know, if you're an insurance company, uh, what's really happening is, uh, AI has entered the, and, and, uh, insurance companies are adding artificial intelligence and machine learning to the actuarial tables are wiping out their competitors, like not in a five-year cycle, like in 18 months, right? Because they can offer very specific pricing to specific cohorts that are not achievable by the other companies. So any company, any insurance company that hasn't fully implemented AI, you know, to the point of, you know, having uh, 10 to 20 AI engineers internally are going to fall back from their lead position and potentially uh, just become the, the BlackBerry MySpace of their industry. Everything is changing in insurance based on this AI. Now, there is a new world order, right? This winter is going to wipe out everybody who's not adapting, right? But if you adapt in a specific way, which I'm going to propose to you, you will be sitting uh, in the, where, where every company wants to be. And you will, instead of having a thousand competitors, you know, everybody implements AI and machine learning correctly in this way, and there'll be three competitors to deal with. And the new world order is better, cleaner, more profitable. But if you don't start taking action now to get there, AI is going to what? And I'll give you an example of this. Uh, I believe in 1954, I have to look it up, when television came to the consumer market, it wiped out 80% of the theater business gone in a year that's like netflix now isn't it <laughs> like I, yeah. yeah so these wipeouts really happen when the iphone came blackberry <laughs> wiped out so the, and and the right way to use winter is coming is to really show in your industry the last three times it's happened and this is it's very easy to predict exactly what is so in media in technology and in insurance, you can see, I'll give you, I'll give you a really good example uh, is one thing that causes these nuclear winters in the entertainment business is that consumer preferences change. So if you think about those movies, The Hangover, The Hangover 1, you know, made a billion dollars, right? Uh, hangover 2, you know, less Hangover, but you can't do The Hangover today because people don't think that's funny. They don't think it's right? funny anymore? Maybe I'm getting old. No, they would <laughs> yeah. still be doing them. You'd have Hangover 11. Uh, right? Yeah, of course. It, yeah, sure. That that kind of humor. Sure. It's funny. You look at the old Hangover, ha, ha, ha. But like, 
you know, for, for real billion dollar releases, all right, that consumers no longer, something about Mary, right? Like that slapstick, mm. very visceral humor in today's world where we had the pandemic, it's not funny. Mm. Right? Go back even further, right? Um, you know, if you can, uh, Jews and gays and Catholics and, you know, Italians and Poles and, you know, um, uh, people with tattoos and people with, with uh, um, oh, I mean, the, in the 80s, right? The movies would make fun of, um, you know, people with disabilities. I mean, go watch Bad News Bears. You can't make that movie today, right? That, uh, that consumer preferences wiped out. It's not like you can sneak your way in. So a nuclear winter is something that is, is happening in the industry that no one, so that's a little bit different from changes. Things are changing. When you say things are changing, then the buyer thinks, yeah, but not to us. And we have a mm. hack and work around. Mm. Winter's coming. Mm. No one can get out of this, this sweeping change. I don't care how smart you are. You have to leave the old way of doing things behind and adapt to a new way. All right. Uh, so, so you've got to figure out what is that nuclear winter that is that that you can see entering the industry that is going to wipe your buyer out unless he adapts to the next uh, a way of doing things and get gets ahead of this wipeout. And you cannot come to me with an industry and say there's no nuclear winter uh, in our industry. Mm. You know, especially today. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, in in the old days, you know, maybe like if it was furniture, nothing was changing. You sort of had to think really hard. But but. Every industry has some is in some kind of wipeout mode, right? And so now, if they believe that their way of doing things is go is going to be uh, um, made irrelevant by the things that are coming, um, then uh, I mean, the, okay, uh, electric vehicles, right? So so you you don't you you know if if you go to a car manufacturer. And you go, listen, electric vehicles are coming. And they're like, yeah, we know. <laughs> yeah, right. We, we're aware of that. We're phasing out gasoline. They're like, okay, good. Uh, so anybody who's like, hey, we're dedicated to the gasoline engine, right? Uh, we're not doing any development in EV. It's just going to get wiped out. Mm. And it's just a very clear example of that. So mm -hmm. you have to bring that to the customer up front. Yeah. And I think this now, is because, yes, oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well, well, the only thing I was going to say is like, and it has to be insightful. It can't be like, right? Because you can really hurt yourself by saying, hey, you know, electric vehicles are, if you, you know, you go to a uh, Brembo, a brake manufacturer, you know, or somebody who's in the industry, you go, you know, electric vehicles are on the rise. You're like, hey, asshole, who let you in here? Okay. <laughs> it's like, obviously, it's like, come on. <laughs> it needs to be insightful. My kid knows that, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. It can't be, you know, on USA Today, colored in crayons. So, it, and, um, now it can be the thing that everybody knows about, but you got to add some insight to it, like some data and some specificity, right? So, uh, you know, so a good example is solar is now becoming to, to the point, uh, solar and wind, it, uh, you know, Texas gets on some days gets half of its energy from solar and wind. Uh, you know, you probably know that you're in this industry, you're fully aware of that. Uh, but one thing that's really interesting is that solar has now, Da, 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 you know, peak beyond um, the, uh, it's no longer necessary to mandate communities to implement solar power. They're doing it on their own and all the regulations are sort of falling off in favor of new stuff because it no longer needs subsidies. Consumers are just doing it on your own and here's some data on that. So now you have the, the, the sweeping issue that people are aware of and you are tightening it up. So your winter is coming is meaningful. Mm. So do the research and come up with some some solid insight that they're going to be like, I didn't know that. Oh, that's helpful. When you can when you can provide some insight to somebody about their business, you are in. Mm. You are an insider. Your deal is basically sold. Unless you screw it up, you know, you just got to go through the numbers, but uh like especially like in the car industry, I mean, they're so data driven. They're, they're they have so much awareness. It's so esoteric. When you can walk into like a, a the, someone in the car industry and provide them some insight on their piece of the car industry, it blows their mind. And they are a hundred. 
you know, it's a little separate issue, but um, the the winter people people have to be aware that things are changing so fast and so dramatically they cannot just keep doing solving their problems in the way that they have been solving them. Mm. And this is like causing their desire to grow, them to take action again, assuming them. Action. There's status alignment, which we already talked about, right? Um, so that's super, super important. There's a flash roll, so they trust your technical expertise. And now you throw at them some insight about their industry. Start to see how this process stacks on itself, right? And there's, it's I, very deliberate. It, here's, what, here's what I love, right? Like For everybody, if you think that you're going to be able to run your business from an accounting standpoint the way you have in the past, right? I got sad news for you. Uh, the, you cannot call the office supplies, you know, your swimming pool office supplies anymore. You can't buy a laptop for your own personal use for your kid's school, right? And then write it off on the business. The AI, the level of AI that the IRS and the government has, right? They know, okay? They have, they have 300 million data points. They, they have the data and they know when you are, uh, so if they if they don't have the actual data that you're cheating on your taxes, they have the pattern match and the likelihood, and then you get a data request. Mm. Cheating on your taxes is not what it used to be. If you are still doing those bad accounting practices, you are going to get crushed by the current audit system. That's winter is coming. <laughs> That's a good winter is coming. <laughs> hey guys, look at Alex. He's like, oh man, I better fucking not. No, no, no. I'm solid. I'm CPA solid. Uh, no, no. Solid, solid, solid. <laughs> 100% solid. But, but that that to me is like a, just the, the, the perfect example of, you know, being able to sell accounting services to, you know, a business. And um, you know, the mm. point is not to terrify people. The point is to bring into high relief actual forces that are truthfully going to really affect them and just let them know because that starts the clock ticking. Mm. Now and, you have some control because mm. you go, listen, you, this is what we do. We help people get out of the way of this uh, force and move into the next generation. But because this force is coming so fast, almost faster than expected, we're super busy. Mm. And so I made a little bit of time to help you understand how to get, solve your problems and get out of way of this change and get positioned for the next five years. Mm. But if you don't want to do it, just tell me so I can go help the people who are super motivated to get this done. Framing, look at it, look, look at the positioning. It, this is great. All right. So there are some more parts to the big idea. There's, the 2x concept and the skin in the game. Um, that's in the book, but I think the big concept is, well, there's, Here, they're all super the, important. Here's the problem with salespeople. Yeah. You're trying to make a commission, right? So you sell the order, you book it, they deliver it, the software installs, everything works for 60 days, right? And then it doesn't work, all right? And you have, not that you're a bad person, but you've gone on to Microsoft. Okay. And then you, this happened to me. I called the company. I'm like, Hey, Joe sold me this. Joe's gone. Well, it's not working. Well, we don't know what he sold you. Um, right. So Joe needs to have skin. And if he wants to sell, and everybody's been through this and they know what happens. The way to sell is you have skin in the game. Like the easy skin in the game is like, Hey, just want to let you hear this all the time. Want to let you know is that I'm on flat rate. Like I don't make a, I only make a sales commission if you've been on the software for more than a year. Nice and skin in the game. I want to know that you are not, I'm not going out in the boat you sold me and you're waving to me from the shore. How's it going? Any leaks out there? Right? <laughs> Call customer service if there's any leaks. Anyway, got to go have a date. I want to know you're in the boat with me. And if it starts leaking, your destiny and my destiny are entwined and our fates are doomed or, or you know, our, our fortunes and our fates uh, to the upside or the downside are, are entwined. And that makes, so when people believe that you have skin in the game, it lowers their uh, uncertainty about working with you. And when people speak about skin in the game, skin in the game historically, 
it's always been a financial, I guess, right. incentive, right? Skin in the game's in the book. Um, I did want to touch on Plain Vanilla, the, um, sure. the novelty sweet spot, because uh, a so, fantastic example so, out of the so, book was, um, he, he, please. Yeah, I worked at a private equity venture capital fund called Alcatel Ventures. A guy named Steve Kim had sold his company to Alcatel. They asked him to run Alcatel Ventures, you know, billionaire, 500 millionaire, whatever. Uh, and, and so I worked there as an analyst. And the thing they said is like, hey, what, what we're mindful of is how many risks are we stacking up? And they would say, listen, one of the risks like we don't care about is uh, technical risk. We believe like these smart engineers or these software engineers or these, these uh, hardware engineers, like they always build what they say they're going to build. Like we one time over 100 deals, they'd be like, fuck, we can't build it. They always figure out how to build it or code it. So that's like not a high risk, right? But so, so really say, they say, Oren, uh, you love every deal, but the thing, how many risks are we stacking up, right? And so what I realized in my deals is if I could just boil it down to one risk and everything else in the deal was normal and has been done over and over again. And this is what I try and show all the entrepreneurs and salespeople that I work with is like, this is the regular way of doing it, except we've added this one twist. And so why there's so many things that this has accomplished, right? Which is people love things that are new and it attracts them. Hey, we have a new software program. Oh, great. AI and machine learning. And, you know, it's got all this new stuff and it's going to make you all this money. Great. I love it. And they run over and they check it out and then they go, um, we love it, but, but um, we're also super nervous because it's so new. And so there's lots of, you know, consumer stuff that the book talks about, but like, you know, what does something have to be for you to change your uh, painkiller? Like you use Tylenol or Advil, right? Like, I mean, you can't reduce the price. It's whatever, you know, five cents a pill costs nothing. I mean, even if you buy it at a gas station in a little two pill pack, I mean, even I'm like, I expect to pay $8. They're like, yeah, it's $1.35 for two, right? So you can't make it cheaper can't make it better. Like you drink it and like five minutes later, your headache's gone or your hangover is gone. And, and so why would, and like, you know, there's no motivation to um, switch. Uh, and, and so it's very hard to introduce something new to people. And so when I try and get them to adapt a new service or come over to me, right? So I'll give you an example. We're an investment bank, right? And so people go, how are you different? I go, we're not different. We, every single investment bank does the same thing. You can go to a Starbucks in Newport Beach and eight in the morning and meet 25 investment bankers <laughs> stopping in to get a, a, a Cafe Americano, right? And you go, what do you do? And it was exactly what I, what we, all investment bankers do exactly the same thing. Plain vanilla. The one thing that I think you'll be, um, that we do better than anybody else is we don't do mass market mailings. Send out in essence a jump ball, right? Buyers of companies or investors hate deals that look like a jump ball. That's just gonna be a massive, everybody coming in and everybody, you know, uh, an auction and their money, it's only about the money. Because they real investors want to come in and know if they're working on the deal, if they're looking at it authentically, like their name means something, their brand means something, their ability to close means something. They just don't want to go in the mosh pit with every Tom, Dick, and Harry. They want respect for who they are. So we rifle shot. We call those guys up and go, John, hey, listen, I have a deal I think you're going to love. We're not, it's not being shopped. We're letting a couple people look at it early. Love for you to come in, talk to the entrepreneur and see if it's something you'd be interested in, um, but it's not going broadly to the market. And so that's what we do. And if you like that, then you'd love the way we do things. If you just want to send out 500 teasers to everybody in the market, well, you know, um, then you can get all these guys in Newport Beach to do that for you, but we won't do it. Mm. So one twist. So if you think about it, well, what was Uber? Well, it's a fucking taxi cab, but you get to see 
is it actually coming to you and how long will it be there? What was Airbnb, right? Um, it was a, a B&B, but you could book it online and get a sense of, you know, see some photos of it and get some ratings on it, right? So it was to get an overnight stay. Um, but all the stuff existed. When you look at WeWork, what was WeWork, right? WeWork, what, they already had co-working. It was green co-working. That's it. If you look at all these big companies, they were the exact same thing of stuff that was already out there with one interesting twist. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you, if you could, to try and put what you have in plain vanilla terms and say, but we have this innovation. And now somebody can evaluate just your innovation as a risky part and not everything. And I like your story, um, the story in the book about the hotel. And if it's too, if it's too disruptive, if it's too novel, there's going to be some like a uh, significant immediate interest, but then it's too risky, right? And so I thought that was a fantastic story because I think there's so many people trying to be like completely different, but they don't realize that it's completely risky then for the person who's buying it. So I think that's a really great twist on the process. Yeah, yeah. Right. and I think- I mean, this is the problem, right? Uh, hey, we're changing the world. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm trying to get new tires on my truck. <laughs> I don't want to change the world. Mm. I want truck tires. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> We're sending socks to every kid in Nicaragua. Okay. It's, it, that is a very narrow subset of people who want to mine asteroids for rare earth minerals. Mm. Right? Most companies want to do it the established way, but in, improved. So when the winter is coming, um, the, you know, the improvement lets them uh, live and survive and thrive on the other side of the nuclear winter. Yeah, th which is great. And I've just got just one more question and there's so many more questions, but I've got one more because I know I'm conscious of time. Um, how do you actually just get the, the first meetings, right? Because the conversations are all about, you know, status alignment and all this and, you know, presenting a certain way and, and so on. But how do you actually just get that first meeting? Like, is it taking the winter is coming, some status alignment and, you know, just doing outreach or is there, you know, um, well, how would you do it? Yeah. So we've done hundreds of thousands of outreach emails and we have a, I mean, we have a whole course on uh, cold email, but I'd give you the basics, right? One is uh, serendipity. If they're, so if there's a feeling like some forces collided to cause this email to happen, not this is programmatic. I was talking to Alex, right? Uh, you know, he mentioned your name twice. I ignored him because, you know, we, we know him in common, social. And he's got the podcast and everything. But then your name came up in a meeting for the third time. And I'm like, I better send this email in. I looked at the website. It turns out you do exactly what we do. Let's connect for five minutes. Worst case, we put each other's name in the Rolodex. Best case, we have a lot in common and start working on a project. How about Tuesday, 1030, Wednesday, 3 p.m., either work. That's it. I bet that's 130 words. Mm. So you're not going in with a big hook or anything like that. It's just more no. social engagement, so serendipity. Serendipity, serendipity. Mm. social engagement. And one other thing, I'm not a robot. Not a robot. Okay. It's not a bulk Misspellings. I, so I'll tell you about something I invented. This sucks now because now if everybody starts doing it, it will erase. I, many times in origination, I send the whole email in the subject line, 300 words. Have you ever seen that? No, I have never seen that. You haven't. That's <laughs> right. Test it, though. Novelty. That's for sure. <laughs> Novelty. Okay. This is not a robot. I'm a real person. Something serendipitous or chance coincidence caused this email to happen. There's something very specific to discuss. How about one of these times? Mm. I like that. I like that. Super a lot. strong. Yeah, great. Aaron. Thank you so much for such a high powered, quick, um, um, completely value adding conversation. Um, 
for the listeners, I mean, I've said it throughout the podcast, but you just have to get the book. Um, it's like, like it will be the best investment um, in terms of um, the sales effectiveness, uh, the ability to structure deals and any type of engagement is where the stakes are high. Um, but for the listeners, um, apart from them actually having to purchase the book, which I highly recommend, like, is there any other, uh, say, site or podcast um, that well, they should subscribe to? Go to orenclaff.com and there's tons of stuff there and sign up for the list. I put out an email, two emails a week, and they're all this stuff, mm. right? And then eventually, if you're actually raising money, which is the highest form of sales, then come either to one of my events here at this office or uh, join the online community that I have and we'll help you raise money. But salespeople can get all of this stuff. They just go on the weekly newsletter that just comes out because we talk about real situations, real tactics every single week. So just go over to orenclaff.com and many good things will happen. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, this has been such a great conversation and the best part about it is just the content in the book. So, but again, thank you for your time because I know how valuable that is. Um, and we'll talk soon. Thanks for listening to the Growth Manifesto podcast. If you enjoyed the episode, please give us a five-star rating on iTunes. For more episodes, please visit growthmanifesto.com forward slash podcast. And if you need help driving growth for your company, please get in touch with us at webprofits.io.